hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of the Canberra Real Podcast. It is your girl, Rachel, back with another episode. Um, today's episode, we are going over Genesis 4, talking about Cain and Abel. Um, to quickly recap, last week's episode, we read Genesis 3, which talked about how sin entered the garden, how God um, kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and we focused on two points, um, one being that because of sin... Um, there was a sacrifice that had to be paid animal, an animal had to die so that God could clothe, um, Adam and Eve in the animal skins and how, when we die and how, and how Jesus, um, was that sacrifice for us as Christians and, um, back in Galatians five. Yeah. No, Galatians three. Um, it talks about how we are clothed with Christ when we are, um, when we are baptized. And so we're able to put on Christ like new clothes, uh, because of his sacrifice and um, we also referenced Matthew 4, 1 through 11, where Jesus himself was tempted in the wilderness. And that was a parallel in how the, uh, Adam and Eve responded to Satan, be, how, how Adam and Eve responded to Satan tempting him to how Jesus responded when he was tempted. So go back and uh, read Genesis 3 for yourself and go back and listen to the last week's episode to get caught up on um, some of the connections that I made and some of the things that I talked about. It was, a, I thought it was a good episode, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So go back and check it out. Um, but without further ado, we're going to pray and then jump right into this episode. So dear Heavenly Father, God, pray God that your will be done, that those who are supposed to hear this message will hear it and it will bless their lives. I pray God that this will be glorifying unto you. I pray all these things in your son, Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So I realize it's a bit better. So we're going to read Genesis 4, and then like we've been doing in the past, we're going to break down a couple of the verses, and we're going to bring in a New Testament reference to tie it all up. So, let's read Genesis 4. So it says, it says, it says, okay, Genesis 4. It says, uh, Cain and Abel. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. And also I want to say, um, if you want like in-depth Bible study of uh, the word in, 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 so in, in the context of like how this relates to like other scriptures and the, the significance of a name, I ain't the one. Check out the Bible project, but I ain't the one. But we are going to read the word. So you can always count on us reading scripture. Everything we talk about is going to come from the word. So. Just, just a preference. So she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd and while Cain, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain prepared, I'm sorry, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. One day, one day Cain suggested to his brother, Let's go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the from the land and have and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden says the descendants of Cain. Cain had sexual relations with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. 
Enoch was the son, had a son named Irad. Irad had a son named, we're going to, you know, some, we're going to skip. Remember how I told y'all at the beginning of this whole series, back in Genesis 1, we were going to skip through some of the, the genealogy parts because they're not, they're not exactly what I want to focus on. That's one of them times. Chapter 5 is another one of them times. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna filter through that get to the last uh, two verses in Genesis 4. It says, Adam had, this is the birth of Seth. Adam had sexual relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to another son. She named him Seth, for she said, God has granted me another son in the place of Abel, whom Cain killed. It's kind of funny to me. It says, when Seth grew up, he had a son named Enosh. At that time, people began to worship the Lord by name. So, like I said, we kind of skip through the genealogies because they're not necessarily pertinent to what, where I'm coming from. So, but we're going to focus on the other stuff. Ah, so, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. I'll read it again. It says, when they grew up, Cain, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. So we see we see a juxtaposition already. We have Abel who was bringing the very best of his uh, of the of the harvest that he had, the very best and I'm sorry, the very he brought the very best um flocks that he had, the very best animals, lambs. Um because we present the best to God. We don't give him our leftovers, we give him our first fruits. That's a that's a principle that even from tithing um you give God 10% off the top, not 10% after you spent, after your bills is paid, after you bought what you wanted to buy. Then, you, no, you give 10% off the top. And that's just the principle of giving God the very best. And the most important thing is that God gave us all these things in the first place. So we're really just giving back a small percentage of what God has already given us. But the thing here is we see a difference in like heart, posture, and attitude. Cain gave just gave God just what he just kind of picked some stuff out of his harvest and just presented it to the Lord whereas Abel took time and he took a little bit of sacrifice on his part it took um and he gave God the very best of what he had the firstborn lambs the the very the best you wouldn't you wouldn't we see that we see the giving of the firstborn lambs um in the the, the old covenant, the law of Moses, the Mosaic law and, and Exodus and all those kind of things of how you present sacrifice to the Lord. You give the very, you give the firstborn lamb or the firstborn goat or sheep or whatever. And then you also give a, you give lambs without blemish. You don't give sick animals. You wouldn't give a sick animal as a sacrifice to the Lord. That wouldn't, that wouldn't cut it, you know? And so it's just this heart posture and attitude of I'm going to give God my very best because he deserves my very best. He is worthy of the very best that I have. Whereas Cain was like, I'm going to just give God, I'm a, I'm going to meet the requirement. I'm a, I'm, you said offer a sacrifice. So I'm just give you, I'm going to just pick out some stuff and I'm going to give it to you. Whereas Abel was like, Oh no, I'm going to give God the very, very best. And that's just like I said, that's just a heart posture and attitude that I know that we all sometimes I sometimes have when it comes to um how we present things to God giving God the very the best like you know we that you hear about um waking up when you first wake up you know what do you do when you first wake up do you go on Instagram do you do you check the news or do you pray do you read your bible and the answer should be we should pray, read our Bible, listen to worship music, those things, because God de God deserves the very best, the very first thing, our first. He gave us the breath and He woke us up in the morning. He deserves praise, honor, and worship. You know. Now, do we all do that? No. Do we, do God do that all the time? No. But it is a principle that I try to practice in waking up and reading my Bible, waking up and just at least, at least before I get my day started, at least saying just thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning waking up and listening to um, worship music as I start my day to get my mind right because it's a heart posture and an attitude so that's all I'm gonna say on that you know you have to look at yourself look at how you present the very best of yourself to God um, and, and it's not in the presenting your very best and how you are and how we see in Genesis 
uh, three and how Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up in a shameful way. We're not do. It's not like that. God knows us. He sees us. He knows who we really are. It is a because God is so worthy. I want I desire to give him his his due because that's just what I want to do. That's the heart posture. That's the attitude that we all need to have. Um, and we all needed to develop. We all need to continue to develop. That's a part of the, in my opinion, that's a part of the sanctifying work the Holy Spirit does on us every day. So moving on to verse 7, and then we're going to come back to verse 7 at the end because I have a verse in the New Testament that I'm going to tie this up to. So uh, it says, back in verse 7, so this is once again, it says, Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. And so we see point blank period. God tells Cain, he's basically like, why are you? He's like, why are you upset? You didn't give me the very best. He said, you will be accepted if you do what is right. So that means that it's like, Cain knew that Cain could look at Abel and see how Abel gave the first lamb the very best of his flock. And Cain looked at his sacrifice and saw it was not up to the same level. And then he was mad. It's like, why are you mad when you knew that you didn't give your very best? So God's like, why you look so dejected? If you had done what was right, I would have accepted it. But you didn't do what was right. So I'm like, he's like, why would you, why, basically, why are you mad? Like, don't be mad. You know, you, you did it. Don't be mad. So it says, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Like I said, we're going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to just let that one sit with y'all. Because we're going to come back to it at the end with a New Testament reference. But there's a lot of stuff going on with that. It's crouching at your door, eager to control you. I mean, is that not how sin is today? Is that not how our desire, our sinful desires to do things, um, that we know is not right. It's just right there. Temptation's just right there. I'm just ready for us to just, mm, you know what? I do feel like cussing them out today. You know what I'm saying? It's just right there. It's always just right there at your door. And it's up to us to, uh, well, praise God. He's given us the grace that he's broke. Well, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save that part for the, for the end to tie it all up. So we're going to move on to verse 9, 8 and 9. It says, One day Cain suggested to his brother, Let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? So in that one, we see, specifically in verse 9, we see God asking a question that he already knew the answer to. And that is kind of a flashback to chapter 3, where God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? He knew they were hiding. He could prob he probably knew the, the exact GPS coordinates of where they were standing. But he asked them because he wanted them to understand. He wanted them to be able to, to respond to the question, where are you? And for this one, we see God, uh, God is asking Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? God knew where C Abel was. God knew Abel had just been killed by Cain. God knew Abel had just been murked. He had just been taken out. We don't know how he was taken out, but we know other than the land, the sacrifices of um the sacrifices of animals we see in the in, in with with the first the first lamb and then when it comes to in genesis 3 with god killing an animal to make clothes for adam and eve this is the first instance of like human murder this is the first instance of you know crime if you will and so it's like god it, cain knew and that's another thing cain knew we know when we sin in you know there may be some small instances there may be some exceptions when we really don't know we are very naive in our sin but cain knew that was wrong because he was like God is God is asking you, where is your brother? And you say, I don't know. You know exactly where Abel is. You buried him over there. You left his body over there. You knew where Abel was. Don't do that. You know? And it says, Am I my brother's guardian? That that verse almost, that piece is like it's it just sticks out as one of those one of the many things we see throughout the Bible where people got a little too audacious with God, in my opinion. But we do it too. We do it today. I do it myself. But it's one of them things that it sticks out. You're like, I don't know if you should have said that like that to Yahweh. You know what I'm saying? Like to the one true God. 
that was a little that, that might have been over the line a little bit but he said am i my brother's guardian and then the lord responded what have you done listen your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground so god knew what abel ha god knew what cain had done a cain want to sit there and act stupid and it's a little funny a little bit not not funny ha ha but funny like interesting you know but once again the question is god asks god sometimes will ask us a question that he already know oh, no not sometimes god anytime i feel like god asks us a question he already knows the answer to because he's omnipotent omnipresent omni everything he's just everything and everywhere he's all knowing so if god asks you a question it's not for him to know the answer. It's for you to recognize, to register what is God asking me? What is my answer? And how does this play into what God has already told me? If that makes sense. So if God is like, why are you, if you know, if your question comes up in your mind, like you're at, you're at a party or you're somewhere, you know, you're not supposed to be, or you're doing something, you know, you're not supposed to be doing. And the, you know, the Holy Spirit prompts your, pricks your heart. Why are you here? You know, your answer might be, I don't know. You do know. You do know why you're here. You're there trying to fulfill some sinful desire you have on the inside of you. You know why you're here. You know why you're doing what you're doing. Don't play dumb. But you need to correct. You know how it says, going back to verse 7. You will, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. Don't let sin control you. God, God's trying to help you out. When he asks you, where are you or what are you doing? He knows what you're doing. He knows where you are. It's so that you can register, oh, I'm in a place where I'm not supposed to be. I'm in a mindset that I'm not supposed to be in. I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing. That's for us. So the last little part I wanted to focus on in Genesis 4, and it's going to be very brief, before we go to the New Testament reference is in verses 25 and 26, where we see the birth of Seth. And Seth, even according to his name that Eve gave him, says... Um, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, whom Cain killed. And then we see from Seth, the descendants of Adam tracks through Seth because Cain got excommunicated. He was, he was, and that's, that's another thing I wanted to point out. I didn't necessarily have any verses to reference it, at least not for the, the for the purpose of this episode. But if you go back up to verse 16, it says Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod east of Eden um but the point was another point just to keep just a little a little point is sin cannot sin God cannot be in the presence of sin so you see all throughout the Old Testament how in the New Testament how whenever the people are sinful you know I mean, other than the times when God's like, I promised David that I was going to leave an heir for him. So I'm going to keep that promise. But y'all acting raggedy. Y'all acting real raggedy right now. But whenever whenever we see the sinfulness going on in the Old Testament, throughout, you know, with the children of Israel or in the kingdom of Judah, it's kind of God's kind of, he kind of takes it. He's kind of like, hmm, I'm going to let y'all do what y'all want to do. And y'all going to reap the consequences of your actions. You know, you're going to reap the consequences of the sin. And a lot of times I came with people invading Israel, people invading Judah, conquering Israel, conquering Judah, kings being killed left and right. Craziness, craziness ensued with sin. But with God, we know there's order, there's control, there's purpose, and there's um, goodness. But with sin, chaos, straight chaos, lawlessness. So, and if you ever have been... If you ever felt like you have been in the presence of God, like when you're worshiping and you're praying and you're, or you're fasting, and there's this sense of awe and peace that washes over you from having been in the presence of God, you know what it feels like to be out of the presence of God. There's anxiety. They're, they're not saying all the time, but for me, when I am out of step with the Holy Spirit, when I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, when I'm participating in activities I'm not supposed to participate in, or have, sitting in a mindset that's not productive that's a, a mindset um that comes from you know a spiritual battle being worn against me um i feel there's heightened anxiety there's bouts of depression there is um excess worrying and you know just all kinds of stuff that gets triggered 
there's a lack the biggest thing there is a huge lack of peace when i'm outside of the presence of god when i'm in the presence of god peace is my refuge peace is my uh inheritance in the presence of god but you can only have peace in the presence of god so just imagine the turmoil that cain went through and granny did it to himself he knew what he was doing he's killed abel but the 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 turmoil that went went on in Cain's mind, when he had to leave the presence of God, God's like, I, you got it over there where I'm not. You got it over there. We ain't, we ain't doing that in my presence. He was dismissed from the presence of God. I thought that was really deep because I just know when I, on time, I mean, granted, I feel like because of uh, the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, we always, we are always having the opportunity to, to get in the presence of God. But if you've ever been, if you ever felt like you've been out of the presence of God or out of step with God, um, out of pace with God, you then you know, you know the difference. You know what I'm saying? You can feel the difference in your spirit. It's a difference. And because you have a lack, the greatest thing is you have a lack of peace. But anyway, the focus of the last for 24, for verse 25 and 26 was that it was through Seth that we see Noah and uh, we see we see Methuselah, we see Enoch, we see Noah. And um in next week's chapter, um next week we're doing chapter five, and it's really just the descendants of a uh, not Abraham, the descendants, descendants of Adam. And I'm going to just briefly um I'm not necessarily gonna run through them all, but I am gonna highlight certain people that I wanna just bring up just because it says a little something extra about them. And then we're, but next week's episode is mainly going to focus on chapter six with little things from chapter five, just to add, because I don't want to completely skip. There's, there's important things in chapter five, but for the purpose of this, I want to go through my, like the big stories in Genesis that we've sometimes forgotten, or for some people have never really read or sat down and heard for themselves. So that is it for Genesis 4. So now we're going to reference um, our New Testament reference for this episode. And if you go back to uh, Genesis 4 verse 7, which I've been harping on this entire episode, so you should know it. But I'm going to read it one more again. It says, talking to Cain, God responding to Cain's look of dejection. It says, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be, excuse me, and be its master. So originally I was going to read Romans 8, 1 through 11. And I recommend that you read Romans 8 because Romans 8 and Romans 6, which we are going to be reading, um, they both have to do with the power of sin versus living in the spirit. So... While Romans 6 deals with the power of uh, sin's power being broken, Romans 8 talks about life in the spirit. And so um, they're both two, they go together because because sin's power is broken, we have life in the spirit. So they go together really well. But for the purpose of this episode, for the purpose of Genesis 4 and how God tells Cain to not let sin control uh, control him, but rather to, to, uh, be, to subdue sin and to be its master, we're gonna read Gen we're gonna read Romans six. And I was first I was like, should I read all of it? I'm not gonna read all of Romans six, but I'm gonna read a large chunk. So I'm gonna read Romans six, one through fourteen. It says, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Hallelujah. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will be we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our that our that we know that our sinful our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. 
This is the, this is a really key verse right here, which real I mean, all of it references back to Genesis seven. You could you could bring that back to Genesis seven, but Romans six twelve says, "Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God." For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin no longer is your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Praise God. Romans is an excellent book. It's an excellent book. If you have not read Romans before, I highly recommend you read through Romans. Take your time and really digest what Paul is saying in the book of Romans, what God is trying to get you to understand in the book of Romans. It's an excellent book. Um, but yeah, we see all throughout. I mean, and I didn't even finish reading Romans 6. There's some other stuff that's some other good stuff in there. But focus on two verses that really pull back to Genesis 4 verse 7 about not letting um, sin control us and how it's crouching at our door and it's ready to, um, what did it say? It's eager to control us, but we must subdue it and be its master. It says, and once again, in Romans six twelve, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to your sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Because we are, because when we are living, when we before, if, if we are out of Christ, if we are not, if we are not slaves to Christ, we are slaves to sin, and so our evil bodies serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Verse 14, another specific, another very poignant part. Sin is no longer your master. Because remember, it's eager to control us. It's crouching out our door. It's, sin is eager to control us. But we must subdue it and be, and have, and be masters over it. So it says, sin is no longer your master. Um, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So that is what I really wanted to leave y'all with today. God's grace. Don't let sin control you. It's crouching at your door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be masters over it. And because of God's grace, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are no longer slaves to sin slave is no longer our master we do not have to be slaves to sin we don't have to do what our sinful nature desires we can choose to say no that's hard but we can choose to say no so that's what i wanted to leave y'all with today i hope it blessed you um we're gonna pray and then be done so heavenly father god i thank you lord for your word i thank you lord for your grace i thank you lord for jesus sacrifice i thank you god for your holy spirit I pray, Lord, that this message will reach those who was called to reach and it will be a blessing unto those who hear it. I pray all these, son, all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So, that is all I have. And until next time, bye!